Christians now, people are fuming, people are swearing, people are angry because you said something to offend them. And generally at these dinner parties, you have the squeamish people who are like, can we change the topic? Can we talk about something else? Well, this morning we're going to throw caution to the wind. We're going to talk about both politics and religion in one foul soup. That's what we are going to do. Truth is, everyone around us is talking about politics. Every day on the newspapers or on social media, this uh, politician or that politician or some political party is trending. Yet here in the walls of the church, we are silent about what is happening in our nation. Even though we are equally affected by what is being done or not being done in our nation. Someone here might say, but pastor, shouldn't there be a separation of church and state? Yes, that is true. But what, th what that actually means is that the state cannot interfere in your faith. But you as a citizen of this country are not precluded from being engaged in politics. Another person might say, but aren't we citizens of heaven? Why are we bothering with the politics of this earth? Should we just pray kumbaya and just focus on Jesus coming back? Now, Scripture tells us in the book of Revelation 21 that yes, we are citizens of heaven. God has promised us a home. John, writing from the Isle of Patmos, says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. So yes, as Christians, we are waiting with expectation when a new heaven and a new earth show up, where God will be present and everything will be perfect. We will lack nothing good. But if you were here last Sunday, you would know that we began our series in John 17. And Jesus, as he is about to go to heaven, prays the prayer for the church, he says, Father, I pray that you don't take them out of this world, but you keep them in it. Until Jesus comes back, or he calls us to him, we are stuck here. And so we have to engage with the things of this world as Christ's ambassadors. So how are Christians called to live in a political climate while they wait for heaven? That is a very good question. But before I answer it, can I describe the climate or the political space that we live in? I remember it like it was yesterday. My grandmothers, both maternal and paternal, were so excited. They were like little kids in a candy shop. It was because it was April 1994. And they were about to go and vote for the very first time in their lives. It was pandemonium. It was glorious. They were believing that a new hope, a new dawn is coming for South Africa. And for the very first time, they had a say in their future. Posters were plotted all over the country. I know some of you are a bit young, but let me help you. The posters said things like, vote for free education, vote for jobs, vote for freedom, vote for peace. Impile and ngono giti song, which means a better life for all. This is a message that we saw all across the nation in 1994. I remember the long lines in the township as people were excited to vote. Because we never had this opportunity before. There was hope that there'd be a better life for all, that people who'd been oppressed and subjected all these years 
we're now free to embrace something good. Today, 29 years later, some of that hope has been realized. Numerous rural areas now have running water. They have functional roads and the sanitation there. Millions of children have been able to attend school and some have gone on to higher education. 7% of black South Africans are now middle class. That is, they make more than 22,000 rand a month, which has resulted to millions of people being pulled out of poverty. As a country, we've excelled at hosting and being and winning national and international sports events. So when we look back at the hope that was spoken of in 1994, yes, some of that has been realized. But we can all agree that more could have been done. As it is today, in October 2023, South Africa remains the most divided country in the world. The divide between rich and poor has just grown since 1994. That's a photograph of Cape Town. It's not so different from Santin and Alex because that's exactly what South Africa looks like. Those on the right have remained exactly where they were 30 years ago. And those on the, on the left have gotten better. At times we've been called the crime capital of the world. Those of you who remember when we moved from Transvaal to Gauteng, what, did, what were we called? Gangster's paradise. Because criminality was on the rise. Many of you here have been victims of crime, right? You see, we don't need to look under a bush to find out the problems that our country has. You can start looking down your road even this evening when the street lights are off and there's a sewage leak down there. And poor people are begging for the traffic lights. I know some of you are going to go to Willie's after church. And as you stand in that line at Willie's, there'll be newspapers on the stand. Those headlines will be screaming some of the following things. Global report raises red flags over corruption and failing rule of law in South Africa. Rising food prices in South Africa, a struggle for daily survival. Low shedding is increasing food costs, threatening food security. And this one just kicks me. At least 300 counselors in KZN don't have basic reading and writing skills. And this is not just KZN, it's in all the provinces. Our unemployment rate exacerbates the issue of crime. Another headline said, South Africa's Official unemployment levels are at 32.6%, which is the highest in the world. I personally don't believe that this is real. I think it's much higher than this, actually. South Africa's unemployment is a ticking time bomb. Anger rises with, mil with millions jobless. These headlines all come from this year. This is where we are. And if you thought it was only the public sector that was failing, let me burst that bubble. The following thing that's going to come up on the screen is an extract from Pricewaterhouse, PricewaterCoopers' annual global economic crime survey. This report or this paper is written about how private sector individuals deal amongst each other. Not with government, amongst each other. And it says, South African business leaders accept corruption as part of of the cost of doing business in the country. And that may be an important feature of organizational culture in many South African corporations. I repeat, corporations dealing with each other. The 2020 South Africa GECS showed that 34% of, re of respondents reported senior management as the major perpetrators of fraud. And of all fraud incidents, more than 42% were not investigated. After discovery, around 59% were not disclosed to the corporate board. 66% were not disclosed to the regulators or law enforcement authorities. And almost two-thirds, 72%, were not disclosed to auditors. This is the state of our businesses in South Africa. 
Now, we would assume that the auditors are the good guys, right? That once they know the wrong things that are happening, they will come right. They will fix things. No. All four of our big auditing firms have been involved in some scandal or other in recent times. Think of Steinhoff, Tongat Hewlett, SAA, VBS, just to name a few. All of these companies got away with signed financials by the supposed deputy prefects. This shows some, that the rot in this country runs deep. It's not about color. It's not about private sector or public sector. But it's about brazen and corrupt people. Things are bad. So what are we to do? Well, in the state that we find ourselves in, we can choose to respond in a number of ways. Number one, we can be fatalistic. This is when we shrug our shoulders and say, ah, this is the worst country in the world. Nothing will ever come right. What's the point? Some will even say the past was better than democracy. Fatalism. Secondly, we can be denialist. And so we can deny that things aren't as bad as they are. You see, denialists will look at other countries and say, oh, well, we aren't as bad as them. So we are okay. But one thing that we are pretty good at as South Africans is minimizing the problems we have by using humor. Because we turn every problem into a joke. Anyone know this one? <laughs> Yo. No one knows it. Let's move on. And I think the reason why we joke so often about the crime and corruption and everything else is because we're so shattered and battered. We don't know how else to cope. So humor ensures that we can wake up the next day. However, as Christians, there is a better way that we can respond. Number three, so we can pray. Prayer is our way of coming to God and say, God, here are the problems that we face in this nation. Will you intervene? You are all powerful. Can you make a difference? And so in the following scriptures, and I'm just going to paraphrase them. You can go home and read them. In Romans 13, 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Peter 3, these scriptures tell us Whichever government is in place, it has been placed by God. God has permitted the government to be in charge and to rule over you. Our role is to pray for the political leadership that it does what God requires all governments to do. God requires all governments to collect taxes, but to punish criminals. That's what time and time again you read in these three passages. If you are a good person, you don't have to worry about the state. But if you're a bad person, beware. But the government is also called to deliver service for all its citizenry. And so we pray and ask God, would that happen in our nation? Would our government, would our governments do that? But what happens after prayer? What happens after you get up? from beseeching God. Well, prayer is not an end in itself. Prayer for the Christian is our first opportunity to engage the political sphere. It's our first opportunity to engage. Because prayer fuels us to be people of action. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we can't sit idly by while our country, literally in some quarters, burns we can't. You see, sometimes as middle class people, we tend to complain. We say things like we are hopeless, we are powerless. We can't bring about the change. Just listen to any of the radio stations during the week and callers will say things like, well, there aren't enough of us. If the masses allowed us middle class people to decide, the country would be better. 
That is a, such an arrogant statement. Such an arrogant statement. But I'm not talking about that this morning. So because we say that we are the minority, like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, we hide behind our high walls, behind our estates, thinking that those walls will keep the masses out. Remove it if it happened out there, I'll just kind of be okay. At least I don't have to deal with the issues when I'm behind the gate. Yes, our high walls can hide us away from the misery and the pain that's happening in the rest of our country. But trust me, it would, it would be just for a moment. Because when things get so bad that millions of our people who are disenfranchised begin to revolt, when they decide that enough is enough, they're coming for you. Because here is what we naively thought two nine years ago. We thought that by putting more black people into the middle class, into, into suburbia, into the corporate space, getting black kids to go to white schools, that that will be sufficient to change our country. That hasn't worked. Instead, what has happened is that there has been a growing gap such that now as a black middle class person, you are called what? Ingamla. Lukhualaka. So when the revolt happens, you won't be before it, you will be Gamlala. I'm also coming after you. So we don't have a choice but to act. Because after we've prayed, we need to be the change that this nation needs. Here's the truth. No one is coming to save us. No one. Let that sink in. No one. I want to extrapolate on this point of action by taking us to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29. Let's go. In Jeremiah 29, 11, the whole passage, that we like verse 11, but there's context to it. God's people are caught up in exile. And it's a miserable time. They're miserable in this nation. They know where home is because that's where the presence of God is. That is where they want to be. And as a Christian, we are waiting for God. We're waiting to be in heaven because that's where God will be. And so out of the pain and misery of being in Babylon as exiles, they begin to cry out, they begin to pray. And say, God, would you rescue us? Would you take us out of our misery? And some prophets come back and say, yeah, God's going to rescue us. God's going to take us suddenly. I think for many people, escape from South Africa in 2023 would be an answer to prayer. Let's immigrate. Let's do whatever. I'm not opposed to that. The earth is the Lord's, and you can go live anywhere you want to live. But Jeremiah is given these words from verse 4. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles that deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. I believe that God's message to us is the same message that he gave the children of Israel thousands of years ago. God says to them, settle in the land. I would say to you, as long as you find yourself here in Mzansi, stop looking at this place with hostility and contempt. Stop being negative. Rather, desire for this place to flourish. Desire that things go well in this land. Pray for its prosperity. 
But not only that, he says, build houses, plant gardens. All of that speaks of an active citizen. I'm contributing to what's happening here. I'm not passive, I am active. In verse 7, he says, pursue the well-being. Because when that place flourishes, you will also flourish. So in other words, for South Africa to become better, you must contribute something. You must ensure that renewal comes to the city, to this nation. In other words, we can't leave politics to the politicians. It was Nelson Mandela who said the following. Religious communities have a vital role to play in nation building. Just as you took leading roles in the struggle against apartheid, so too you should be at the forefront of helping to deliver a better life for all our people. Among other things, you are well placed to assist in building capacity within communities for effective delivery of a better life. The chief politician in our country said this of Christians. But sadly, Christians have disqualified themselves from playing a meaningful role in the political system of our country. And so because good people have disqualified themselves, people with no capacity are courageously messing up this country. People with no capacity are courageously messing up this country for everyone. Maybe you didn't hear me earlier, but did you know that tomorrow morning, the majority of our age mates, guys our age, some of degrees, are going to get up tomorrow morning and sit at a street corner. Did you know that even though tax was taken from your salary at the end of last month, it will happen again this month. There are kids who will not be fed at school even though the government has a feeding program which is funded by our taxes. Because somebody decided to buy themselves a multi-million rent car. Did you know that tomorrow some CEO will earn 90 million rand while his workers are outside striking for a living wage? This is what we're faced with. And so to seek the welfare of the city, to seek the welfare of the nations, understanding that God, how can I be somebody who is active? When many of you think of politics, you think of three things. Liars, sleepists, and shouters. Right? Because that's what politicians do. Lie, sleep, and shout. But the origin of the English word politics is from the Greek word politika, which was given to us many, many years ago. And that means this to do something, to do something to improve the quality of a place where we belong. That is politics. When I improve the quality of the place where I belong, where I live, I am already engaged in politics. So the shouters, the sleepers, and the liars probably are not in politics. They're in something else. Because they're not improving anything for anyone. So in that regard, Christians have a duty to be political so that as scripture says, all of us can lead a tranquil and a quiet life. Because when the places that we live in flourish, we can do the business of actually telling people about Jesus. Not trying to fix everything. As people who've experienced the grace of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross so we can get grace, and thereafter, he says to us, go out and show the world what a true neighbor is like. We, of all people, should be desirous of acting for the good of all people because of what Christ has done 
for us. We are the ones who should be salt and light in this world. Especially in how our nation is managed. So for me, when you say I'm a Christian, I'll be like, well done. And then you say, yeah, I pray for the country, and I'll be like, two claps. My next question will be, are you political? Are you changing the space around you for the glory of God or to the glory of God? See, as I stand here this morning, I see people who love Jesus, but I also see people who are capable. I see people who are capable to lead, people who have brilliant ideas, people who can work so that we have a better life for all in South Africa. Today is the 15th of October, and we commemorate the death of Thomas Sankara, who was killed in 1987 on the 15th of October. Thomas Sankara is from Upper Volta, or French governed Upper Volta, which today you would know as Bikini Faso. Thomas grew up in a Christian home. He was so devoted to God that his parents said, boy, you should go to seminary. But he thought that joining the army would be more helpful to his people than going to be a priest somewhere. And as Thomas was studying in the army, he was taken to Madagascar where he was taught how to farm so that the people could be able to look after themselves. There was a lot of corruption in Upper Volta at the time. And Thomas and his friends stood against the current government. And at the age of 33, he became president of Upper Volta. He proceeded to change the country's name from Upper Volta to Burkina Faso, which means land of upright men, land of incorruptible people. What Thomas does as a 33-year-old, he said, I no longer want to have a relationship with France. I no longer want to have a relationship with the IMF. And he went about his nation teaching his people how to plant and be able to feed themselves. I know some of you are like, plant, because you only go to Willie's for vegetables, plant vegetables. <laughs> be able to feed themselves. He educated women and children as his priority. He refused to take debt from any organization in the world. And so by the time that Thomas was killed in 1987, Bikini Faso was one of the best countries to live in in Africa. It was self-sufficient and people were literate. Unfortunately, on 15 October, he was assassinated by a hit squad. One of his best friends, Blaise Compare, and some say the French were involved in that. Uh, it's not, not too far fetched, right? Were involved in his assassination. Here's where Bikini Faso is today. Blaise became president until 2014, since 1987. What Blaze did, he rolled back all the changes that Thomas Sankara introduced into the country. In 2016, the nation of Bikini Faso is one of the least developed nations in the world. You know that they just experienced a revolution. I'm not going to call it a coup. A revolution recently, because that's how bad things are. Proverbs 29 and 2 says, when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. When the righteous flourish, people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. I read the story of Burkina Faso and I think to myself, will South Africa be one of those countries where good men, good people choose to do nothing? Now, I know that as Christians, we understand that we'll never live in a perfect world. 
We can never make our country so good that it is perfect. However, our contribution to our country can be such that when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven becomes a reality. Jesus taught us to pray like that. Because there's something that as Christians we understand is that what God has poured out in us can be seen in the world around us. The psalmist says in Psalm 82 and 3, provide justice for the needy and the fatherless. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and the needy. Save them from the power of the wicked. Isaiah 1 and 17, learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's case. Amos 5 and 24. But let justice flow like like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. If you who know God's justice, if you who know God's justice don't get involved, who else will do it? Who else will do it? Last one. Coming a little bit closer to home. Steve Biko. Some of you wouldn't have known that he was a Christian. But he said this. Obedience to God in the sense that I have accepted it is in fact at the heart of the conviction of most selfless revolutionaries. It is a call to men of conscience to offer themselves and sometimes their lives for the, for the eradication of evil. Steve Biko was killed at the age of 30. At the prime of his life. Because he believed that making a difference was worth it. Yes, as a Christian, Jesus Christ offered his life so we don't have to give up our lives in that sense. But because he sends us into the world to be his representatives, to be salt and light, we can't sit idly by. We need to do the work of the gospel while we wait. Peter says, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. We are waiting. So what are you going to do while you wait? What are you going to do? I would say open up yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit and bring about change to our land. You see, we're about to go into one of the most important elections of our democracy. And I know we say this every now and then, but I think next year is pivotal. Because we're at a crossroads as a nation. Do we carry on the same way we're going? Do we go back to the past, as some people are saying? Or do we envision a new country where there's justice and opportunity for all? As I said, in front of me, I see people who are capable Capable to bring about change. Now, I'm not telling you who to vote for. But unlike the biblical writers, you have an opportunity to at least make a difference, to contribute to this nation by voting. So you can vote for any political party you think will bring about change, but vote you must. If you're confused about any of the parties that are available in the ballot box right now, maybe you can follow that little new rule we have. We can have independent candidates. Maybe you can be one. I don't see the change that I, that, that, that I require in my nation. I will be the change. Perhaps you can encourage some of your friends who are always talking about politics and moaning to shut up and stand for election. Talk to your family and friends. Tell them, the guys, I am sick and tired of hearing complaint after complaint. This week, I met three strangers 
all of them complained about the state of our nation. I asked every single one of them, are you going to vote? My vote will not make a difference. That was sad. Perhaps we should tell people that there's no such thing as losing your ground or pension because you didn't vote for a particular, for a particular party. What can you do? You can assist people to register to vote. Remind your friends. Be that irritant. Registration happens next month. Go register. There are many civic groups that have been formed. And so because I, won't be so I, don't, I don't get accused of favoritism, I won't mention them, but you can find them. There's one in Santon somewhere and a few others. Places where you can share ideas about how you envision the country going forward. You can share some of your crazy ideas. Because I think it's crazy ideas like Thomas had that change a nation. I have a crazy idea, and I'll just share it with you. From next year, I would say, no government official is allowed to drive a German car. No BMW, no Audi, no Mercedes-Benz. You are a civil servant. You have to serve. I talk to our Korean friends and our friends in China and say, you guys have nice big limousines, nondescript. Can you send a few to our country? A thousand of them, in fact. And if you work for government, you cannot own any other car but this car. I'm sick and tired of seeing X5s and Q7s parked next to shacks because the minister has come to see people. Boo-hoo. In a million rand car next to a shack and you can't provide services. That's embarrassing. This message is just the first shot. Because as the elections draw close next year, we're going to keep on talking about this. Not because I'm trying to get you to vote for me. I'm not running for election. <laughs> but because I need God's people to realize that while we're living on this earth, while we're here, we can't just pretend that we will pray and do nothing else. We can't. We have to be people who Jesus Christ can say, ah, there's salt, there's light. Because of men and women of integrity. And I would like to, as Christians, we call ourselves that. To make a difference. So God can be glorified.